And so your sense organs are any group of sensory cells and they will respond to specific stimuli such as light, sound, touch, temperature, chemicals. Okay, so your sense organs would then be, for example, your ears, your eyes, skin, tongue, nose. Okay, and a sensory cell will convert one form of energy into another. So, for example, your eye will convert light energy into the electrical energy of the nerve impulse. Your ears would convert sound vibrations into that electrical energy of the nerve impulse. Okay, so energy could be mechanical, chemical, light. Okay, and those would all be converted into electrical energy of the nervous system, which would then be interpreted by the brain, okay, to be aware of what is happening around you. So the sense organ that we're going to focus on is going to be the eye. So if you get given a diagram of an eye, like this one, this is, if I look at the image of the eye, I've got what I see from the front in my eye socket, okay? But the image that I'm looking at here is if I take this eye and I directly look horizontally through it. So I remove those outer layers and I am looking at the eye this way. So this is what I'm seeing over here. So I have cut this eye horizontally. So if I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it that way across and I'm looking down on that. So this is what you see in that line of sight in that image there. Okay, so now if we label this image, because we need to know all the different labels of it, starting from the outside and starting from the front. Okay, so this very outermost layer that we have there, that is a clear layer that we call the conjunctiva. Okay, directly below that conjunctiva would be your next layer, which is also a clear layer, which helps light impulses move through, okay, or light rays. And that line would be the cornea, directly in the front. Okay, then there is a gap before you get to the lens, and that gap would be your pupil area. Surrounding the pupil on each side, those thick lines there would be the iris, which is the colorful part of your eye. And then directly behind that pupil would be the lens. Okay, the lens is held in place by muscles at the top over here, which we call the ciliary muscles. Okay, as well as all of these thin little lines over there at the top and the bottom, which we call the suspensory ligaments. Around the outside, the very outer part, except for this area in the front, which is clear, this would be the white part of your eyes, which we call the sclera. Directly below that, you have a membrane, and that membrane would be called the choroid. And then inside the choroid, there's another membrane, and that membrane would be called the retina. And the retina is where you have all of the cells that allow you to actually pick up that light and see. And along that retina, there is a very concentrated area of cells, which we call the fovea. And then the end point would be your optic nerve leading to your brain. 
And where the optic nerve leaves the eye, that area is called the blind spot. Okay, so those are all the labels on the eye that you need to be able to know. And if you got this cross section through the eye, you would be able to point out and label each of those points. And then if we just look at what some of those components actually do, if I've got my images, okay, and I've got the functions of each of those. So the retina is that innermost layer, and we can say that it is a light sensitive layer. And it's made up of cells that we call rods and cones. Now the rods will detect light intensity specifically and the cones will detect color. So that's what our retina does. And then the thing that carries the impulses from the retina to the brain would be your optic nerve. The sclera is the tough white outer coating of your eye. And that would be for protection. Okay, and then the transparent region of that sclera in the front of the eye that refracts light to bend would be the cornea. Okay, the iris has muscles in it that control the size of the pupil to regulate light coming in and out. And then your ciliary muscles and suspensory ligaments would control the shape of the lens. Okay, to focus your light. And then to add one more, the choroid is a layer that contains a black pigment. Okay, so that's why in the diagram it's always shown darker. And that is there to absorb any excess light. And it also contains a large amount of your blood vessels, okay? And then one extra label that wasn't in there that just want you to add is in the center of the eye. We have this jelly-like substance, okay, that allows the eye to hold its shape and that we call the vitreous humor. So, it's the jelly-like consistency that gives the eye its shape and actually holds it solid there. Okay, so those are just the components of the eye and their functions. So now, if I look specifically at some parts of how the eye works, starting with the pupil reflex. Okay, so we looked at nerves last time. So now, remember, I told you about the nerve impulse reflex arc, okay? And changing the size of the pupil is one of those reflex arcs, okay? You do not control it. It automatically happens, okay? And the pupil changes shape, either getting bigger or smaller, depending on the size, on the light exposure that we have. So if we go out into a very bright area, the pupil gets smaller to try and protect the cells of the retina so they don't get damaged by bright light. And if we go into a very dark area, the pupil gets bigger to try and get more light in so that we can focus on images and see in that dark area. Okay, so it's controlled by a nerve impulse. And those nerve impulses 
either contract or relax certain muscles in the iris, okay, which would then change the size of the pupil. So, in the iris, there are two different types of cells. So, I have my iris. I have muscles that are round, okay, and I call those the circular muscles. And I also have muscles that go long ways, like that. Kind of looking like the spokes in a bicycle wheel. Okay, and those ones we call the radial muscles. So now, our circular muscles and our radial muscles work together depending on if we're in bright light or in dim light. So in bright light, I have my circular muscles all around there. And the circular muscles contract. And when the circular muscles contract, they pull that iris bigger and the pupil gets smaller. And at the same time, the radial muscles will relax to allow the circular muscles to pull them forward. So the circular muscles contract and the radial muscles relax. And that allows for the pupil to get smaller. Okay, because remember in bright light, we don't want to let a lot of light through. So we want the pupil smaller to protect the retina. And another way of saying that is the pupil constricts. Then in dim light, I want my pupil to get bigger. So in order to do that, the radial muscles will contract and they will pull the circular muscles back to allow the pupil to get bigger. So my radial muscles contract, the circular muscles relax, and the pupil gets bigger. And another way of saying the pupil gets bigger is to say that the pupil dilates. Okay, so now remember, the circular muscles and the radial muscles are always there, both at the same time. Just one is contracting and one is relaxing each time to either get a pupil smaller or bigger. So because they work opposite each time, we can say that those two muscles are antagonistic. So antagonistic means that when the one is contracting, the other one is relaxing and vice versa. They're always working opposite each other. Okay. So then if I take a closer look at now how I see. So once I've allowed the light in through the pupil, okay, the light has to then hit the innermost layer of the eye, which we call the retina, that inner membrane. And the retina contains millions of cones and rods, okay, which are your light sensitive cells. So now the cones will distinguish color. And there are three different types of cones. Okay, we have ones that would distinguish between red pigments, one for green pigments, and one for blue pigments. And then there is always a combination of those that get stimulated to see different variations of different colors. And then the rods are sensitive to low light intensity. So when you walk into a dark room, the cones can't pick up any color, but the rods would then pick up 
those low light intensities and you would then see images in shades of gray. So for example, at nighttime or walking into a dark room, you see everything in gray and then as soon as brighter light comes in, then you can start to distinguish between more colors when the cones become stimulated. Okay, so now the cones are concentrated in an area that we call the fovea. So the fovea only contains cones and that's where most of our images get formed and it allows us to see all those color images clearly. So the fovea is a very important area with a high concentration of these light sensitive cells to allow us to see images. But just near the fovea is where you also have your optic nerve. And in that optic nerve, there are no sensory cells. So there's no rods and cones. And that we call the blind spot because no images can be formed there. So if any image or any light comes in and it falls on that blind spot area, you will not see any image because there are no rods and cones to pick it up. And it's where the optic nerve leaves that retina area to go to the brain. Okay, so you will never see any image if it falls in the blind spot. But what you do want is the image to form in the fovea area so that then you can make sense of seeing it. So how that image actually forms is with a process called accommodation. So accommodation is focusing on either near or distant objects and depending on if an object is near or distant, it needs to change the shape of the lens in order for us to refract the light carefully. Because an image that's far away has light coming off of it in different directions compared to when it's near. Okay, so the lens needs to change to either bend the light a lot or bend the light a little bit, depending on if an object is near or far. And that process we call accommodation. So for a distant object, okay, if I have my eye, okay, and now I have something that is in the distance. If an image is far away, so let's say I'm looking at something far away, the light that comes off it is traveling mostly in straight lines. So now because it's traveling nice and straight, I don't need to bend it as much when it comes through. So what happens is my ciliary muscle relaxes. So remember the ciliary muscle is sitting on this top area there, okay? And at the bottom, because there's one at the top and the bottom. So the ciliary muscles, relax and when the ciliary muscles relax what happens is the ligaments at the top and the bottom of the lens get pulled tight okay so now the ligaments are tight And when that happens, it pulls the lens, okay, because the ligaments are pulling them, and it pulls it from either side, and it gets pulled very, very thin. So the lens becomes thin, and when the lens is thin, it does not need to refract light very much, okay? So the light that's coming in gets bent only a small amount, to form the image on the retina that we want. So my light coming from there, coming in, then gets bent slightly to form the image. Now, as you can see, when it bends, that light coming from the top gets bent and goes downwards. Whereas that one from the bottom gets bent and goes upwards. So this image that gets formed here actually gets formed like that. It gets formed upside down. And what happens is all the images in your eye get formed upside down like that in this area, which would then be the fovea. 
That impulse triggers, goes through your optic nerve and to your brain, and your brain is the one that actually interprets it and flips the image the right way round. Okay, so all images, when they hit your eye, are actually upside down, and the brain is the one that flips them to be the right way round. So then if we look at a near object, so for a near object, if something is close, the light is actually refracted a whole lot more and now it's coming in wider directions. Okay, whereas when it was distant, it was coming more straight. Now that light is moving out in more directions. So the ciliary muscles that we have need to contract. And when the ciliary muscle contracts, it allows the ligaments to relax. And when the ligaments relax, it doesn't have any tension on the lens, so the lens gets smaller and fatter. Okay, so the lens becomes thick. And when the lens is thicker, it refracts the light a lot more and it bends it so that the image would form on the fovea upside down. So it just means because these light rays are moving out in more directions, the thicker lens can bend them more to concentrate on the area that we want. So from a distant object, ciliary muscles relax, ligaments tighten, lens gets thin. In a near object, ciliary muscles contract, ligaments relax, lens gets thick. Okay, and then the image, is always formed upside down in the eye and the brain is the one that turns it upright okay and that is how we see images